Hey everyone, uh, welcome to the SharkNet General Interest uh, webinar. Um, my name is Tyler Collins. I'm giving the session today, and it's going to be on creating and distributing Python packages. Okay, uh, I'm out of Brock University, which is not too far from Niagara Falls. If you don't know exactly where that is, and like Pavel introduced, I'm a uh, analyst at SharkNet. My background is primarily computer science. I did a little bit of AI, and I do a little bit of neuroscience stuff too. So if you have domain specific questions for me, great. If not, I'm always happy to put you in contact um, with people who know more about uh, the other disciplines. Okay, so before we uh, kind of get into the meat of today's talk, I want to talk about um, how I typically give one of these um, and the most important things to focus on. Okay, so starting with num number one here is the slides will be available online after the session. So if you're one of those people who takes lots of notes because you like taking notes and it helps you focus, that's great, go ahead. But there will be like commands actually in today's slides that I would kind of expect you to follow later. Don't worry about writing all of those down and taking super strict notes. You can copy and paste from the slides that'll be available later, okay? So uh, like Pavel talked about in uh, the opening of the talk, um, SharkNet has a YouTube account. There's a couple of, couple of my videos there and there's lots of other great videos as well where we all post all of our recordings so definitely go there um, if you want to hear back you know my narrative of today um, in terms of questions happy to answer questions from chat as I'm going because you know that can hopefully help me uh, clarify anything that's been uh, a little bit vague but the kind of open question period will be uh, saved for the end of the session. And I don't think we're gonna go exactly the full hour. So uh, yeah, um, and I have here at the bottom of my slide, the most important point of today, which is we're not memorizing commands. We're not uh, scrolling documentation, reading things or memorizing options or anything like that. It's really just the concepts we're focusing on today and hopefully getting your buy-in for doing some of this stuff in your own work, okay? And lastly, I, I kind of want you on, on that principle to focus on today's talk in terms of sharing your own thesis code, okay? So say you have some sort of uh, project you're working on, you probably do right now because you're connected to academia somehow, and you want to share your code. Maybe you are, you know, PhD year three or master's year two, and you're just wrapping up and you want to share your code to the next student down the line, Okay. Uh, what we're going to cover today is something that will get that set up for you in a nice way and an easy to maintain way and a way uh, that looks good and professional. Okay. So the outline for today, the first thing we're going to do is we're going to uh, talk uh, terminology. So these will just be some quick definitions, nothing too crazy. We're going to talk about um, what it looks like to install a Python package. We're going to talk about what a Python package looks like, what makes a good package, and what makes it look professional. We're going to talk about the actual meat, again, of today's talk, which is uh, something called cookie cutter, which is going to help us solve a lot of our problems. We're going to talk about its interaction with GitHub. And then the last little bit will be about actually building shareable objects and deploying them. And at the very end, I'll have a slide with some of the information up and uh, the takeaways from today's talk. Okay, so terminology. So if you are a Python enthusiast or you know it very well, or you're a formal computer scientist, um, some of these definitions here that I'm using might make you cringe a little bit, but uh, just bear with me. These are just the definitions we're gonna be working from today, uh, just for the sake of kind of our conversational approach to um, uh, this topic and trying to get by. Okay, so number one, package. I'm just going to be treating the idea of a package as a directory, you know, a folder of some sort of grouped code. So that's just, you know, you have a folder, there's a whole bunch of Python functions in there. It has an init.py um, and it specifies, you know, which functions are uh, available outside of this uh, directory and which ones aren't, these sorts of things. A distribution package, however, is different in the sense that it's a shareable form of the regular package. It's not just a zip that you send to your friend. It's not something you put on a USB drive and hand to somebody else. It's an actual packaged object, okay? And that's typically a wheel, okay? So then the definition of a wheel is a pre-compiled and ready to use distribution package. There's a whole bunch of caveats. This is uh, one of those definitions that might get me in trouble with the people who know a lot about this sort of thing. Um, but 
I, I hope you can see this. Um, this is the Python wheel site. So if you want the formal, formal definition, you can you can read all this and I've linked it. And it, there's all sorts of examples on the right side over here of all the packages that use it. And it's and it's great and we should all be convinced. OK, uh, next is pip. Pip's a command line tool for installing Python packages. I think that most of us will be familiar with that if we've worked in the Python ecosystem for some time and they're especially, you know, uh, are wanting to share things or have used other packages like pandas, numpy, tensorflow, pytorch, all of these things typically include pip commands. Uh, next uh, is a virtual environment. I'm kind of choosing to define this as an isolated installation of packages and Python versions. So, you know, we do this so that we can have uh, conflicting packages in two separate installations managed separately. We can make changes, we can do whatever we want, and we're not polluting our kind of main Python installation on our operating system, which often controls important things. Okay. And then last but not least, and kind of the uh, the highlight uh, eventually at the very end of the talk is uh, PyPy. This is the Python package index, and it's typically where pip reads from by default. You may have actually never, uh, never been to this uh, website. Um, struggling to change tabs a little bit. There we go. This is actually what it looks like. So I'm logged in here because um, as part of one of our steps later, you will have to actually create an account, but we can go in here and we can search all sorts of different things. We can search uh, pandas. There's all great. Here's exactly what we want. All of these things. Typically, uh, you would just be running this command up at the top, the pip install pandas. I think we're all uh, fairly familiar with that. Okay, so that's our terminology and our kind of definitions. Uh, let's talk about how we install packages in Python. Um, so you personally might do this a little bit differently. It might be uh, Anaconda, Conda, Miniconda, or any of those things. Um, personally, I don't use that because it doesn't play nice on uh, our HPC systems. So I like to do things a little bit like this. Um, if it doesn't match with your use case, maybe that's a great question for later and we can talk about it. Okay, but this is how I do it. So I say Python 3.10-M, so I think that stands for module or something like that. So I specify the VMV module, which is the virtual environment, and I call it newEnv. And then the next part of this magic spell is source the environment slash bin slash activate. Okay, so now we have our own kind of Python environment. It's brand new, it's fresh, there's nothing in it. And I do pip install pandas, and then presto change oh, now I, have in, uh, now I have access to pandas. I can make my data frames. I can read CSVs really easily. It's great. Okay, we're, we're all fairly familiar with that. But as a question to pose to you, and maybe something that you've thought of is, how, how did it get to this point? Not, not the virtual environment, that's kind of complicated. But how did pip install pandas, go get pandas, install it and do all of the different things that is necessary. Because if we actually look at what happens after I run pandas from this blurb from my terminal, there is downloading pandas 1.5, CP310, many Linux, all of this stuff. And if we look down at the bottom, we have all of these things about the date util, we have six, we have numpy, which you'll probably recognize. Uh, PyTZ, honestly, don't know what that is. Okay, so how how does pip install pandas know to go and do all of these things and how can you do that? Okay, so what I'm gonna get at today is that that is totally doable for you and is something we can do very, very easily. Okay, so let's go take a look at a modern package. We're gonna keep picking on pandas because I like it and I use it pretty much every day, every time I use Python, everything's in data frames these days. So this is what it looks like on GitHub. This is the landing page and it has a couple of interesting things. So over on the left, it has a button that takes you to the pandas PyPy page where we were earlier. It's got an about on the top right. It's got links. It's got a license, these codes of conduct. It has releases. It's got its nice kind of blurb about what it does, relational labeled data, all of these different things. So this is kind of what's expected of you if you're kind of pushing something to pip, that it's linked up with all of these different things, that it has a license, that it has auto-documenting uh, features and all these things. And that can be like a really tough, uh, maybe overwhelming thing. Because if we 
go look at the actual repository, if I hop off of my slides here, we can see that like, it's almost difficult if you've never looked at this before where the source code even is. I can tell you it's mostly in this pandas folder, but there's doc, there's licenses, there's a dot GitHub folder. I mean, I guess I could zoom in here to make it a little bit easier on your eyes. And, you know, there's contributors, there's, there's all sorts of things. It's very, very overwhelming. Okay, but oh, didn't mean to skip ahead. Uh, it's complicated, but it's, I, I'm here to tell you that it's not something where somebody sat down and they created each file manually and they named them a particular way. And no, 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 no. There's, there's all sorts of tools that do this for us. Nobody did anything manually when it comes to uh, making all of these releases and these licenses, okay? So what makes a good package? And what do we need to be able to do to get onto uh, PyPy and share our code? And what are just some nice to haves? And specifically for the purposes of today, we're not actually gonna cover the things that are under the wants here. So our needs, we definitely want version control and hosting. I'm, this isn't necessarily a seminar for Git. I'm gonna talk about uh, a few Git commands here and there because I mean, it's pretty important to our livelihood these days. Okay, so version control and hosting, awesome, definitely need it. Documentation, you want documentation, I'm gonna tell you now, no matter what, because if it's not documented, it's not done. And if it's not documented, you will get a thousand emails for the rest of your life. If you document it, you can tell people who email you how to use it to read the documentation. Hopefully all of those arguments <laughs> convince you that documentation is important. Uh, next need is shareability and releases. Of course, we want to do something better than just handing code to our friend or the next student in line. And then we also want some sort of licensing. This maybe doesn't seem that important, but if you want your kind of product or your shareable thing to be actually used by other people, there's rules that govern that sort of thing, okay? So having a license or a contributing thing or how to cite your paper that's part of your thesis that your package kind of is, is something that you should definitely have there, okay? And then lastly, I've got the wants there down at the bottom, you know, some fancy issue management, some autom uh, automated building of things and, and testing. Um, I'll point them out when they're relevant, but uh, not within today's scope. Okay, so I've kind of brought this up with a, a couple of my points so far, but we're in Python, right? Python is the, the main language for, our, our argument being we should never reinvent the wheel, right? And the question is, does something exist that can manage this for us? All of these project dependencies, all of these files, and of, of course, right? Like we, we read the advertisement for today's talk, we know that it exists. And so today's talk is specifically cookie cutter and its interactions with GitHub. Okay, so what is cookie cutter? What does it say on the tin and what does it offer for us? Okay, so it says that it's a command line utility that creates projects from cookie cutters, templates, okay? For example, creating a Python package from a Python package project template. Wow, that was actually hard to say. Okay, and if we look, it has all of the nice things that we would expect. It's actually got uh, an image loading problem there on the build status thing, which is kind of funny. Uh, it's got buttons for Discord for its documentation, some rating of code quality, and it's got all these nice links. Um, as a side note, before we move on to actually using it, um, it does also support uh, getting your projects started up with JavaScript, Ruby, CoffeeScript, I'm not super familiar with, all of these other different things. So um, learning cookie cutter and getting familiar with it isn't um, just a one-off thing. You could use it for your other languages and your other projects and, and things like that. Okay. So cookie cutter is going to be our solution to creating all of this boilerplate, which is all of those numerous, numerous files. Okay, so I'm not going to show you uh, exactly what it looks like at the end. I'm just going to show you how easy the process is of getting this started up um, and creating your, your project template. Okay, so step one, um, as, as you may have guessed, cookie cutter is a Python uh, project itself. So we need to make sure that you have cookie cutter in some uh, Python installation you're working with. I think it's an okay one to have in your kind of uh, global Python inst uh, installation and, you know, that environment, but you may want to create another environment or, I mean, it's up to you. Manage things however you want or whatever is convenient for you. 
So we do that with pip install cookie cutter. We know how to install packages from uh, earlier. That's great. And then the next thing that we do is we point cookie cutter at a reference template. So we do that with cookie cutter and I have a link to my personal fork of the cookie cutter Python package repository. Okay, I can kind of explain more of what this looks like later. And when we get to the takeaways, I'll talk about it. But that is how cookie cutter um, reads a particular template. Okay, so you would have a repository for your JavaScript template, you would have one for uh, your markdown template or anything like that. And the reason it's mine, my, my online handle is Andesha. The reason it's mine is it allows me to change the defaults, which you'll see in just a second. Because now what's going to happen is Cookie Cutter is going to ask you a series of questions about what your thesis project, remember that's kind of our going thing that we're working with here, your project is all about. Okay. And again, having your own one that you're pointing it at. Uh, will let you change the defaults. You can continue to use mine. It's fine. It's just more typing for you. Okay, so hopefully we can see this okay. So I've done in my terminal here in my new environment, I do cookie cutter and I point it at my personal uh, fork of the Python uh, template. So you can see in the first red box at the top, hopefully here, hopefully the font's not too small, that it asks for my full name. So I give it my full name, Tyler Collins but I've left it empty because that's the default, okay? So the things in brackets are your default. It knows my email, it knows my GitHub username because I've told it that. And then the second red box is the first time I'm overriding what one of the defaults are. Okay, so I say it's called teaching example because that's what we're doing today. And then it suggests a project short description. I say making a cookie cutter example for testing and I go through and I answer more and more of the questions, okay? So I disable um, testing because that's not within the scope of today, but cookie cutter definitely supports your, your Travis CI and these sorts of things. Um, the select command line interface is gonna set you up on the right path for um, if your Python package actually grants uh, command line options itself. Like cookie cutter, you can see up there, it was a command line command itself, right? So that's an example of what it could help you set up. Um, it asks you for your license. Now, I am not a lawyer. That is very much <laughs> hopefully clear to everyone. So definitely do some reading, watch a YouTube video at two times speed or something like that on what the licenses are and what they mean for you and um, pick appropriately, okay? So the default is the MIT license. Not going to explain so much about that. That's your own suggested reading later. Okay, I answered all of my questions. Where are we at? On the right side of the screen, I've run a command called tree, which is nicely available in Bash and kind of, uh, you know, any sort of Linux environment um, to print out a directory structure. And here's what we get we've answered all of our questions and it's made all of this for us. Okay. So we've got a docs folder, that's for our auto-generating um, documentation. We've got a history file, we've got the license created such that GitHub's gonna be able to read it. We have the authorship, so that's where you can put in your name or how to contact you or how to cite the paper, the contributed thing, you know, um, what best practices are. Maybe that's not so relevant for just a smaller thing um, that we're working on today or working with today. Um, going down the list, um, my bullet points are a little out of order, but uh, there's the manifest. <clears throat> what the manifest is actually for, uh, this is regular terminal right now, over here on the right. The, the tree command was in the regular terminal. Uh, previously, um, that was also in the regular terminal. Um, manifest, that's right. The manifest is for packaging things uh, with your package that are not code, okay? So like, say for example, I don't know, you need to package an image with your uh, um, your Python package for, for some discrete math problem or, or something like that. Or maybe more topical is it's the uh, 
weights in some sort of machine learning neural network thing. That's kind of where you would want to package that. Definitely outside of the scope of today, you'd have to go read the documentation on how to do that. But that's what you would want to look at if that's something you needed to do. Uh, your requirements underscore dev. What that file uh, is, is how you specify to other developers and uh, contributors what they need to install to do development work on your package, OK? Because the dependencies of the package itself are specified somewhere else. And we'll get to that in a little bit. OK? Um, the teaching underscore example directory in blue near the bottom, the second one from the bottom, that's actually where your code lives. That's, that's where the code lives. Um, that's where you put all your files. That init.py is how you export your functions to the wider kind of um, project context and, and so on. Okay. The last two things there, uh, the tests and the talks.ini, that's for your continuous integration and your continuous delivery stuff, which again, outside of the scope. But yeah, I did skip over one, and that is the setup.py file. And it's kind of its, its sibling, the setup.cfg uh, file. So uh, what we're going to do is we're going to take a specific look at that next because it's uh, generally generally the most important. OK, so on the right side of the screen over here, I've got a code snippet. It's not the full thing. Um, it's just that this happened to fit very, very nicely on my slide. Um, there's only like five or six more lines that exist above it. Maybe if we have more time, I can I can show what that looks like. But this is just a Python file. OK, so what it does is it specifies um, how to build your package and all of its metadata properties, you know, like who you are, what version it requires, its license and things like that. And this is the stuff that gets auto-populated into, you know, um, that Python package index with all those fields when it makes all those badges. That's how all of that stuff starts to show up is, is this kind of function right here with all of these arguments, okay? The most important thing is you'll see it kind of under the description here, the install underscore requires equals requirements. Requirements doesn't exist in this snippet here, but it's just a list. So in there, in pandas, pandas has this function to the same thing. Inside of there is something like numpy and all of the other packages that it requires. Okay, that is how the dependencies are so are, are structured. So if you're basing something off of PyTorch and it's a module that requires PyTorch, you would put PyTorch in a list there with all of the other different things. Okay, so there's lots of other stuff here too. There's the URL for how to get to it. There's the version. There's the zip safe. Not all of this is super relevant, and that's why we're using Cookie Cutter, right? Is it'll ask you the direct questions that are necessary to get you going. And then for what you need, you need to go read the documentation. OK. So now is requirements to, uh, requirements.txt cookie cutter. Thank you for the question. I guess I should read it out. Is the requirements.txt uh, kind of a file, or is it a list hard coded in setup.py? So you could technically have setup.py read that file. But the convention, if I go back to this screenshot over here, the convention is to have your dependencies inside of setup.py and in the requirements file to have the packages that are required to do development work, which can sometimes be different. Say, for example, if uh, as part of testing your development environment, you have other external packages. You wouldn't want people who install your packages to install more than necessary. So we have this great project structure. Everything's going well. How do we get this linked up to GitHub? OK, just, just an important note for your own understanding. Git itself, the program, and GitHub are actually two different things, OK? GitHub is a hosting service that does things with Git. Git is its own program. So right now, before we get to GitHub, we have to turn it into a Git repository, OK? So we're going to do that in the regular terminal. And we're going to go into our teaching example directory. So I do that with CD teaching example, and I run git init. OK, so uh, depending on your version of git or where you're working, you may be presented with some sort of prompt about choosing a branch name. Um, follow the prompt and you know actually read it and make your decision. OK, the next thing you do is git add dash a, or you could do git add period or anything like that at all of the files in the project, however you need to do that, and then commit them. Typically, the convention for this is 
uh, to say initial commit or first commit or something like that. And at the very end, if you run git status, it should look a little something like that. So you're on branch main, nothing to commit, working tree clean. You've made your first commit, it looks good. Okay, now on to the GitHub side. It's really easy. Um, I'm not gonna narrate this entire slide. I kind of think it speaks for itself. Um, the most important thing for you to remember is to keep your information consistent between the sources. So there's no link between GitHub and the things we've made so far yet. So you have to keep the names the same yourself. So call it teaching example, make the description the same. So it all lines up and plays nice together. Okay, everything under the name and the description, leave it alone, cookie cutter did that for you and just click create repository, okay? Typically with GitHub, after that, you're presented with your empty repository and it gives you a couple suggestions on what you should do to get started and moving forward. I typically, uh, in, in this case, follow the second prompt. It'll be the middle one and it will be about adding a remote. Okay, so I have my example down here. I do git remote add origin and I specify that link. Um, and then I do git push dash u origin main. Don't memorize any of this, okay? <laughs> this is just two commands and it should work easily with uh, anything that you've set up as long as you you know have done it before, okay? Don't focus on what push dash u means, just that you're following this recipe. Okay, so assuming everything has worked, you should see branch main set up to track remote branch main from origin, whatever that means, it doesn't matter, okay? So at that point now, our cookie cutter project is up on GitHub. And so I actually have done this. Um, so you can go check for yourself later and see what the very first commit looks like and see like if it all lines up nice. But if we look, I have the, the snippet right here. We've got all of our license stuff. We've got the history. We've got my signing of the initial commit. I'm uh, also, it, you can see it has the MIT license, all of that stuff. It's it's all nicely there and formatted for us. And if we look at the repository later, it'll look nice and professional with its badges on uh, the README at the very top of the README. Okay, so let's just do a quick status check-in and see where we're at. What we have going right now is we've got our GitHub integration, we've got our source hosting, we've got version control, We've got our licensing, we've got our readmes, and we've got our nice modern project layout automation. So we don't have to, um, you know, write a big PDF or a Word document about how to use stuff. You can go in and much like you would write code, you would write your documentation in a very similar sense. And there's automatic options for doing all of that stuff. Okay, so at this point, maybe that's good enough for you, but I'm I'm pretty sure that I can convince you to go just a couple steps further to get this such that you can say pip install my thesis and on any machine connected to the internet, it'll install your package, okay? It's very, very easy. There's just a couple more commands and you're good and you're done. Okay, so that's where we're at. What we have left, releases, sharing, PyPy, pi, and then uh, how to develop locally. but. That's the very last slide. Okay, so releases. Um, this is kind of not uh, something that you'll see in kind of a standard Git uh, tutorial, but one of those things you can do is you can tag commits with, uh, with information or versions to signal that they're special in some particular way. Okay, so one of the things we're gonna do with that is tag commits that are complete or a stable version with a version number. Okay, so step one, of course, is to do some work on, on your package and change things or add new features. And step two is to go to the history file and document the changes you made, okay? And then also in the init.py as part of the project, update the version number there to be the same thing, okay? So those should match for all of the automation to play nice, okay? So if that's done and that's committed and pushed up, the next thing you're gonna do is actually uh, tag uh, your commit. You're gonna run git tag with um, 0.2.0.
that's, you know, you can tag them on whatever version uh, scheme you want. That's just what I personally use because it's the kind of Pythonic one. And you do git push origin double dash tags and presto change o git now is aware that this is a special commit somehow with a release and it's that particular commit. Okay, you've done it. So now you could point somebody to be like, oh, yeah, go to this commit. That's this version. It had this functionality. Okay. Next, distribution. Very easy, I, I promise. So as part of your environment, pip install wheel. That's the actual package that allows us to build wheels. And the two things we have to do is run slash setup pi sdist and dot slash setup pi bdist will. They're both uh, dot slash in this context, okay? What that's going to do is make two packages for you to hand off to your friends. And if you don't want it to be something that can be pip installed from elsewhere, you're done. Believe it or not, it's, it's really that easy. You're, you're done. You would give somebody those particular things, and there's a pip install. I believe it's dash F or something like that. You'll have to look it up. And you can point pip directly at a wheel file, and it will install it. OK, so that's how you would hand it off if you didn't want it to be fully public. You could hand it to the next student. You could hand it to your supervisor. You could hand it to whoever you want. OK? Awesome. Uh, if you have to do your dependencies, remember setup.py is basically the make file, if you're familiar with that concept. And that's where all of the stuff is uh, defined about special cases in terms of, you know, I need this version. Uh, or how to contact me, any of these things. That's reading for later, and I've linked the, the relevant documentation for that. OK. One of the last but not least steps is deploying it to PyPy. Hopefully, you're still on board with everything that's happened here. Step one, make an account on PyPy. OK, so you saw earlier that I had my account logged in at the very, very beginning of this talk. It's very easy. I recommend keeping your naming conventions consistent with either your school ID or your online handle. I mean, everyone has an online handle now. It's probably fine. It will prompt you uh, with trying to set up your environment. I would recommend, uh, I believe it's their second prompt as well, where it encourages you to set up a .pypyrc file. Okay, And what that is is a, a special file that says um, you have permission to upload to PyPy under a particular username, OK? It gives way better instructions than I can ever give and much more formal. So I'm not including it here. Go read PyPy. It'll help, OK? Next step, pip install twine. That's the service and the command line thing that we use to upload to PyPy. So it's pip install twine, as we've seen. And all we do, assuming that the wheels built properly earlier, is we do twine upload dist slash star, because we have to upload both files that are in there, and you're done. That's it. Now you have the ability to pip install whatever you want from anywhere ever, OK? As a caveat, your dist file may be populated with previous builds. Keep it empty before you upload, and that will fix your problems. OK, so let's test it. Let's, let's actually see what it looks like. So pip install teaching example, it went and did a thing. Excellent. I go into my Python interpreter at this point. I can import teaching example, and I access one of those hidden attributes, the author one, and I see Tyler Collins, which is most definitely me. OK, one thing to keep in mind going forward, and this is something that I do want you to kind of pay attention to, is you're going to notice here this inconsistency with the dashes and underscores. That's a Python thing. I don't think uh, pip wants you to use underscores and names. So typically, the name on pip is going to be a dash, but importing it is going to be an underscore. I don't have all of the historical reason reasoning for that for you, other than that's just one of those common gotchas that you have to be uh, a little bit wary of. OK? So typically, when it comes to um, doing all of these things, one of the things you get up, uh, give up rather, is the ability to edit things locally. So, you know, you do these builds and you fire it off and then you have to pip install yourself and you can't make changes to things live. You can't bug test. Okay. 
the best part about this entire procedure and everything happening with it is that you are able to still develop locally, okay? You do not need to give that up at all. PIP really conveniently includes a dash E flag, which will basically signal to PIP that you are editing this package and it is live and that it needs to constantly reinterpret it, okay? So for example, you would go into the teaching examples directory and you would say pip install dash E period, as in like this folder. And from that point on, in your environment is that package in an editable way. So you could go and you could print line debug, you could add your print lines wherever you wanted in your package. And then in a script in a completely other folder, as long as it's using the same environment, run that and you would get all of your print line debugging. Okay, that's kind of the strength of all of this. Okay, so if you want the actual formal documentation for how that's done, uh, go search pip install the editable mode and that'll give you a whole bunch of other uh, tips and tricks for that. And uh, I believe there's some visual code, um, visual studio code, um, I guess it's like just visual code studio, whichever, those sorts of uh, handy tricks for that, okay? All right, awesome. We're kind of already at the end here. So um, the takeaways for, for today, I, I think the number one is our standard Pythonic kind of takeaway, which is don't reinvent the wheel ever. And especially don't reinvent the wheel when sharing code. Don't, don't pass a USB of your code in your life or the external hard drive of your life between people. Somebody's going to drop it and you'll cry. Do it this way where it's version controlled on a remote and away from you who maybe drops things, that's me, where it's more safe. Use cookie cutter to automate the project boilerplate construction. It will hopefully generate better habits with you and also make your projects look a lot more formal, looks good on interviews and all that good stuff. Uh, the next thing, change the defaults. So cookie cutter will give you some uh, actual tips in its readme on how to better um, change the defaults and give you better behavior. It makes your life easier. That way you don't have to type out your name every single time you create a uh, template with cookie cutter. And then if it's something that you're interested in, um, there uh, there's Travis for your uh, continuous integration for your testing. And then uh, there's also read the docs, which is a free service that allows you to host documentation. Okay, and before I get to the questions, and I see there's one in chat, really quickly, what I wanted to do, um, if I scroll wheel here, uh, which, okay, no, that's not that. So if I go over to this, I'm going to go over to my personal profile really quickly here. Um, for, for this current job as part of Shark Den and part of my uh, duties, I actually developed the package ViewClust, which does a whole bunch of analytics on the performance of the scheduler. Hasn't been updated very recently because we haven't added or haven't needed to add any new features, but this was um, made with cookie cutter three years ago. The docs aren't building right now because I have to update some stuff, but as you can see, we've got some credits. There's me, coworkers, and so on. Uh, yeah, and you can see it looks all nice and formal. Looks very, very nice. I think so. Anyway. Okay, so thank you very much for your attention. That's kind of the end of the formal seminar and lecture period of it. Um, there will be um, a link to the to the YouTube recording at some point in your email, I believe, and that will include a reference to the slides. Um, if you'd like to email me, my inbox is kind of open at any time. Uh, it's tk11br at sharknet.ca, which is there. I'll put it in chat just to um, get that going if you need any questions and you're shy and don't want to ask. But yeah, thank you very much for your time. And uh, yeah, Pavel, I think you can go ahead and stop the recording.